Seven Secrets of the Goddess by Devdutt Patnaik Chapter 5 Lakshmi's Secret Wealth Can Liberate Part 1 The living Sajeev in Sanskrit seek food the lifeless Ajeev and the dead Nirjeev don't This makes food the fundamental target Laksh of life From Laksh comes Lakshmi Lakshmi is food Anna in nature and wealth Dhan in culture Lakshmi is called Kamla or lotus Just as the fragrance color and nectar of the lotus attracts bees food attracts all living creatures Plants go towards sunlight animals towards pasture and prey Food never goes to anyone everyone comes to food The quest for Lakshmi establishes the food chain Plants seek sunlight and water for nourishment herbivorous animals seek plants for nourishment and carnivorous animals seek other animals for nourishment The quest for Lakshmi also creates the pecking order Herbivores form groups called herds to secure themselves Carnivores form groups called packs to improve their chances of finding prey Within the herd and the pack there is hierarchy based on strength The strongest is the alpha who dominates and gets access to most food and more mates The omega is the weakest gets least food and fewest mates Thus the hierarchy ensures only the fittest survive so that the next generation is fitter than the previous one hence more likely to survive The lion is the alpha carnivore on top of the food chain but even the lion does not attack the elephant which is much bigger The elephant has no natural predator and unlike the lion it feeds every day that is why the elephant is most closely associated with lakshmi another reason why lakshmi is closely associated with the elephant is because the animal is always associated with water where there is water there is life where there is lots of water there are usually elephants elephants love swimming and they spray water on each other using their trunks A pair of elephants are often shown spraying Lakshmi with water using their upraised trunks evoking rain. Dark thunderous monsoon clouds are equated with a herd of trumpeting elephants. In drought, the one animal that always knows where there is water is the old matriarch of the herd who has lived longer than any other animal in the forest. The Purans state that there are 8 pairs of elephants located at the cardinal and ordinal directions. These are the diggajas that hold up the sky in some texts and the earth in others. These are not ordinary elephants, they are special, white as cow's milk. For cow's milk was the much cherished wealth of the Vedic people who chanted the Shri Sukta hymn in praise of Lakshmi 3000 years ago. In the Purans, Lakshmi has three fathers: Varuna, Puloman, and Bhrigu. Varuna is Asura in the Vedas. But in the Purans he becomes a deva god of the sea source of all water the Purans describe Puloman as the asura king and Bhrigu as the asura guru this makes Lakshmi the daughter of asuras the word asura has been given a moral turn in recent times they are visualized in children's books as dark skinned and fat and ugly with horns the embodiment of evil It is easy then to assume that Lakshmi's association with asuras stems from the fear of materialism and the corrupting influence of wealth. But equating asuras with evil and by extension devas with good is more a convenient translation than a correct one. The result of a Judeo-Christian Islamic lens that came to India first by our Mughal rulers and then by our British rulers. In the Purans, devas and asuras are both children of Brahma. Devas live in the sky and asuras below the earth. All wealth exists below the earth, for it is below the earth that seeds sprout, metal is created and water is hidden. To pull this wealth out, we need the sun, surya, the wind, vayu, fire, agni and rain, indra. In other words, we need devas who then become gods as their actions favor humanity. Asuras become demons as they resist sharing Lakshmi with humanity. Varuna as god of the sea gives its wealth of salt and fish and pearls freely. 
without asking anything in return. That is why perhaps Varuna is not Asura, but Deva. Varuna is also the symbol of generosity, one who is truly affluent. Pulaman rules the land below the earth and does not release Lakshmi easily. Humanity has to invent complex agricultural and mining processes to procure wealth from the earth. The wealth obtained is called Pulomi, which means daughter of Pulaman, another name for Lakshmi. Bhrigu, guru of the Asuras, is associated with prediction and foresight. His son, Shukra, is associated with creativity. A man who can predict the future, who has foresight and is creative, is more likely to create wealth. That is why Lakshmi is called Bhargavi, daughter of Bhrigu. That makes her Shukra's sister. Lakshmi's value comes only when she leaves her father's realm, when she is no longer immersed in water or buried under the earth. The creation of wealth, then, is a violent process. Forests have to be destroyed to make way for fields and human settlements. Raw materials have to be pulled out of the ground for industries. In other words, Asuras have to be killed to obtain Lakshmi. She dazzles only when she leaves her father's realm and is seen seated beside Indra, god of the sky, bringer of rain, lord of Amravati. Wealth that belongs to humans, which has been acquired from nature, is best represented by the pot. The pot is a human invention that allows people to own water and carry it wherever they go. It is the symbol of cultural intervention, of industry and market, creating value out of natural resources. Water in the forest is available for all animals, but water in a pot belongs to the owner of the pot and whosoever he or she gives it to. The pot that is Lakshmi belongs to Indra and has been wrenched away from the Asuras. The Asuras who are killed by Devas are time and again resurrected by Shukra, who has the secret known as Sanjeevani Vidya, which brings the dead back to life. This alludes to the fertility of the earth, which brings back crops year after year. The act of harvesting the crops is equated with the killing of the Asuras by Devas an act of violence that enables Lakshmi to come into the house of the farmer. Thus, harvest festivals of India, be it Vasant Navratri, goddess worship in spring, or Sharad Navratri, goddess worship in autumn, marking the winter and summer agricultural cycles of India, are invariably associated with the killing of Asuras. For example, Durga kills Mahishasura in Dasera and Krishna kills Narkasur in Diwali. That is why the battle between Devas and Asuras is cyclical. It will never end as long as humans depend on harvesting nature's bounty and seek the regeneration of nature's fertility. As Indra's wife, Lakshmi is known as Sachi and Indra is known as Sachin. The arrival of Lakshmi turns Amravati into Swarg or paradise for she brings with her Kalpataru, the wish-fulfilling tree, Kamadhenu, the wish-fulfilling cow, Chintamani, the wish-fulfilling jewel, the Akshaya Patra, the cornucopia, the pot that is always overflowing with grain and gold. These treasures enable the devas to live a life of luxury. They do not have to work a single day. They simply have to make a wish and their desires come true. It is an enviable lifestyle. What is never clarified in the Purans is why Indra is entitled to all the pleasures that Lakshmi has to offer. It is simply assumed that wealth belongs to the devas. No explanation is offered. Modern retellings often equate asuras with the original forest dwellers who were displaced by deva, migrants, who came with superior agricultural and pastoral technology. This is how the eternal battle between asuras and devas is explained sociologically. Marxist anthropologists equate devas as the haves and the asuras as the have-nots. Traditionalists tend to describe devas as good and thus entitled to Lakshmi. But this does not make any sense as Indra in the Purans is always shown drunk with somras, immersed in sensory pleasures offered by apsaras, often being indifferent, even rude, to sages. From the asura point of view, Indra is a thief. But unless the devas steal Lakshmi out of the subterranean realm, Lakshmi cannot have value. The Asuras do not see it this way. They simply want their daughter or sister back. So they lay siege to Amravati and constantly fight the Devas. 
This turns paradise into an eternal battleground or Ranabhumi, with devas constantly struggling to hold on to their wealth. Indra thus has prosperity but no peace. This naturally makes asuras, source of Indra's great displeasure, the villains of the Puranas. We can equate Indra and the devas with wealth generators and value creators who are often at the receiving end of criticism because the process of generating wealth is invariably violent. Ecosystems are destroyed and people are compelled to do work so that industries and markets can thrive. Wealth generation also creates social divides on economic lines. For those who establish industries and markets, devas feel entitled to claim the lion's share of the wealth generated much more than those who actually work in industries and markets asuras who end up feeling deprived and often exploited the devas can also be inheritors who have not earned anything but have the benefit of enjoying vast wealth because they were born in a particular family indra is unable to see the unfairness of the situation because he is born into privilege he is unable to see the rage of the asuras each one demonizes the other neither understands the other the conflict between devas and asuras is very much like the conflict between capitalists and socialists for the devas the battle is between those who create wealth and those who do not create wealth for the asuras the battle is between those who steal wealth and those who do not steal wealth what is wealth creation for one group is wealth theft for another group neither can agree about who should get the lion's share of the wealth generated each one is therefore convinced the other is wrong resulting in a relentless righteous battle chapter 5 lakshmi's secret wealth can liberate part 2 chapter 6 vishnu's secret detached engagement brings order part 